is one of those people, he's sort of like Carl in that he has a huge wide uh, parameters in his talents. I mean, to be able to compose, play all the percussion instruments classically, jump set. In other words, he, he's, he's like Carl as in, in the percussion world because he can do it all. I love David Whitman. He's he's such a cool guy. Um, I had I had a chance to play with him um, right before his first album came out. He had a, worked with a drummer in New York that came out and had worked writing some charts, and it was really fun. It was a uh, in multiple styles of jazz. It wasn't just one particular style. The cool thing about David is he not only does these great projects, but he does all the follow up, and he stays on it and promotes it and sends it everywhere and gets it you know, sends it to the Grammy people and, you know, a lot of musicians do their project and then they're kind of like, oh yeah, I'm done, I'm moving on. And, and he's really good on the follow through and promoting his music, which I think is wonderful because it's great music. I think he's a great representation of the San Diego scene because he does so many different things uh, within music. You know, he's, he's a passionate teacher, um, but he also does theater work. Like he's, you know, he, he's a percussionist that plays with symphonies or with, for Broadway type shows. And then he's a jazz drummer, but he can also play classical marimba. And he also, you know, has uh, had some success uh, making records. So, you know, he's kind of a renaissance kind of a guy. My name is David Whitman, and I am a percussionist, first and foremost. I'm a recording artist. Uh, I'm a um, lifelong educator, dedicated educator, and... Uh, I play, uh, in, you know, I'm a freelance artist locally, in addition to an uh, international recording artist. Uh, I play in the local Broadway house here in town. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of the, I guess, up until through the pandemic, you know, until then, the sort of the exclusive performer at the Civic Theater for percussion events. And, you know, I sub and do extra work with the San Diego Symphony and uh, I have some award-winning albums. My both of my albums to date have been very successful. Um, I am, uh, I think, it's safe to say when people need somebody, you can say that I'm one of the most sought after percussionists in Southern California. Um, I don't feel comfortable saying that all the time, but you know, I guess I'm the one that played all those gigs and you know, I hope to play many more to come and I don't wanna you know, rub my colleagues the wrong way by talking about my gigs or anything. But I, I have a diversified skill set, and so I have a lot of gigs that I have do, that do and have done and can do. Um, I, uh, I'm a composer. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm a father to a, a one and a half year old son and a five year old daughter, and husband to my wife Nobuko. Becoming a father, becoming a family man, and how, how has that changed your approach to yeah. to your craft? Well, that's a great question. And I think it's, it's a multi-dimensional answer. You know, balancing work and family is always a struggle. And I especially feel that. Um, I was on the way up here, I was thinking about things that m they might be interested in hearing from me and about. And one thing is that from the time that I was like 19 and quit my last part-time job at a grocery store, I have ever since then been devoting every moment of every day to becoming the artist that I already vision. It's really difficult to always have, to be always compelled to be working towards this vision and then to have this whole other thing. But the flip side of that is that, as you say, it <clears throat> Those life experiences have enriched myself as an artist and they have enriched my artistic works and uh, in fact, you know, Oh Clara is, you know, named for my daughter and my upcoming album is called Oh Hugo, actually. I would just be, I just want to practice, right? And my wife is often the one that pushes me over the edge and says, Dave, look, this, you got to get this interface. You do this. I know what you want to do, but you need to be, pay attention to this side of things too. So this isn't all me, you know? This is like my wife also noticing my, my vision and like helping me bring that to fruition. It does bring in a certain um, 
Justin mentioned kind of a southern charm. And is there a reason that you chose um, specifically um, O, comma, and then the exclamation mark? Yeah. So, like all things that I've learned about that I do, maybe it's not this way for everybody, but I am not good enough at things to do them all by myself, to have them be as good as my vision is for them. So I did not come up with that picture for the cornfield. The, the design, I didn't, I didn't want it to be, you know, good. I wanted it to be really good. So, um, you know, actually Andrew, the composer, like one of, his, one of his main bags out in New York for a long time was doing designs. He was Maria Schneider's assist, personal assistant for a long time. And he, you know, he's been a dear friend to me for a long time. Like one night we were going to go out drinking and it's like I had to do a horn part for a jazz band. I was, I was directing a, a you know, the University of Wisconsin Stout jazz band. I was a, a director and somebody lost their, it was a like fourth horn part, uh, trombone part. Like this one had four trombone parts. And I had to refinale it out for rehearsal the next day before we could go out drinking. And Andy's like, oh, come on, Dave, here, let's, let me do this. And he sat down at Finale, and I know we all know about short keyboard shortcuts and stuff, but there was no MIDI board, and that's not the way he normally works, so he did without the MIDI controller, and literally started typing, and I, and I watched the whole part just go, oh, about like this fast. And it was like 30 seconds the thing was done. And, and he, you know, we would like, if, if we were doing a gig in Wisconsin and somebody needed an arrangement for a whole orchestra in one night, you know, they, they could get him. Andrew was, is so skilled at like this area um, and he knows me so well. And I, as time goes on, I see like my own self image is not, you know, not, not always accurate, not always the best. And I think, you know, he captured me pretty well with that cornfield and he captured what we did that day, you know, when we, you know, when we walked into the studio and like recorded that record, actually it was two days, but we did those two days, you know, and what, and what I did with the other players and, you know, what the music does when you listen to it, it's really weird, but I think he just nailed it, you know, with that cover, like when you hear the record, you kind of like, oh yeah, it's like a, you have the blue sky, you have the clouds, you have the cornfield, you know, it captures my Midwestern, you know, who I am, like growing up in Wisconsin, and a certain optimism, and you know, hopefully, you know, a desire to pass on those good things and those interactions with other other people. So I didn't pick that out. Now, Eau Clara was, you know, I, I thought about many different titles, and uh, my co-producer Chris Montgomery suggested Eau Clara. And, you know, I don't know if it was me that decided on this or that, but that's a decision that I made in tandem with him, too. Um, and I don't always do that on... It will be, you know, four records as leader now. Some, sometimes it's just the way I do it. And it's, I always open that up to the people that I'm working with. And this being my first record as a leader that I intended, for which I intended the whole world to hear, you know, and see, then, you know, I wanted to make sure that it was good. What kind of artistic communities, artistic opportunities are there growing up in Wisconsin? Oh boy, well, you know, Sorry, like, David, can you, can no, you like, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a, well, there's a, there's like a, a like a wiki article here that um, Sky Landers was writing. Mm -hmm you know, talks about my, my time at Eau Claire with, um, you know, and actually it's a really rich community of artists there. Eau Claire is kind of like, it's like the art, the, like the musical, Eau Claire, Minneapolis is really a musical hub for, you know, more so than Chicago uh, in this sort of like Midwestern area, the Great Lakes region. And there's a university there and, the, and they have five jazz bands and the first big band has won as many downbeat awards as the one o'clock band in North Texas. And I found that clearly they're less known. <laughs> Everybody knows about the one o'clock band. People don't always know about Eau Claire, but for example, last night, I was moving the timpani away from the mainly Mozart festival. The artistic director is the bass player, Scott Pingle. He's a UW Eau Claire grad. He's the principal player with the San Francisco orchestra. 
It, and and um, so anyway, on this record, there were a few Eau Claire guys too. So there's a play on words there as well because it's the community of Eau Claire and my daughter's name uh, and Eau Clara and how much she changes my life. You know, um, David King from Happy Apple, from uh, The Bad Plus, he's from Minneapolis. I studied with him for many years. The Minneapolis Symphony is known to be among classical musicians, to be at the very least a very fine orchestra, if not one of the better ones in the in the nation. And I was I got to see them play. But then there's there's, you know, this rich history of jazz. I attended Shell Lake Art Center in northern Wisconsin, which is the oldest, um, longest running jazz education summer camp in the in the nation. And it's always been run from Indiana University of Indiana. It was Dominic Sparrow who headed up the jazz program at the University of Indiana Bloomington. Um, and you know, I have a lot of, there's a lot of weird connections that I've had in my career between like different elements of the story, but um, that, I think that camp and the university there and its connection with Bloomington and, you know, a lot of other things developed this culture of jazz at Eau Claire. And, it, and you know, people would, between Chicago and Minneapolis, people would stop and play Eau Claire. And it, had, it has, I think, taken that and ran with it and it became like sort of an indie music capital of the Midwest. Bon Iver, Justin Vernon, he and I went to college together and you know freshman year you know Mount Vernon was like his one of his early bands people know them from when they moved to down south to like North Carolina but Joe Westerlin and Phil and Brad Cook and Justin Vernon and I and Trevor Hagen, who's another, you know, like international kind of an indie music person, um, and some other indie, mu indie musicians that, you know, probably you would recognize if you, you know, follow like new music and indie music. You know, we would like just eat lunch every day. And, you know, and I don't go around, I haven't ever talked about Justin, I, I never wanted to like ride on his fame. And we were never like super close buddies. We were good, we were just good friends, you know, eating lunch in a group of friends, you know, but there's it's just, I bring him up because, you know, he's like now one of my favorite, you know, I listened to his, for the first time, his duet with Taylor Swift. Uh, God, it's so beautiful. He came into the Stone's Throw before he did Emma and Forever Go and was like, Dave, you know, I'm going to do some recording, you know, in my cabin. Like, how much you charge for that? You know, like, you know, and I'm all busy, you know, and everything. And like, he got the other guy, or, you know, the younger guy or whatever behind me or whatever, who's super cool, Sean. Well, and it, of course, Sean went on. I don't, some of you might know these people, but you know, Sean, S. Carey, you know, he, he was Justin's drummer or something. And I don't know, you know, as, as well as like the music fans, but you know, in Weather Report and you know, some other, you know, like, I mean, the list really can go on and on and on, but like, there's this, there's just been like a huge thing in that area for jazz and like authentic instrumental music. Did you go as a, as a camper or as a counselor or as an educator? How did, what was your capacity? In, as it was well, a middle schooler, I won a scholarship from my like local community music, something or other. I played like solo thing to win a scholarship to go to the camp in seventh grade. And I went in seventh and eighth grade on scholarship, and I th and I think I maybe went one more time. And Ron Keyser, Jeffrey's dad, taught there, and he taught at UW Eau Claire. So I, went, I knew I was going to go to Eau Claire because when I was in ninth grader in high school band, my band director brought Harpoon, the CD that Eau Claire did on Seabreeze Vista, I think was the label. Yeah, like the college band was like on a label, you know. And it won, you know, the Downbeat Award and, you know, it was like, you know, maybe an educational Grammy or something like that. And, you know, the, all the band directors in like, you know, the five state area, you know, had these CDs, right? And everybody knew like this was like a pro band and all of these guys were, and they were. And, you know, like now I do, I was going to open, I, I didn't do it, but I had an opportunity to open a show here that was going to be with uh, the Bon Jovi keyboard guy David whatever he did Memphis the musical and he's doing another one it's probably happening or would have been happening right now on Broadway and I was gonna like maybe play but I didn't end up doing it my schedule is so impacted um, at the time and so but anyway I'm talking with that guy you know and people that come through when I play you know the Broadway tours here and you know like Larry Lelly who was like right before me in band like he blows it up out there in New York City like he's the number one guy out there everybody wants him Not the number one guy I mean you know there's a lot of guys but 
he's a guy that's, you know, top five, you know, like everybody, like, can you get Larry? You know, it's like that kind of thing, right? And they're like, then it's like out here, oh, you know Larry? Oh, he, well, kind of, like he was in the band before I was like the, never mind, it's a long story. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. And same, you know, it's like I saw Scott Pingo last night and it was so cool. He's like, oh, Claire, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, th there's like a, there's a musical thing there that, you know, I was able to springboard off of. Before I left my undergraduate, I played with a huge list of artists. And like when I got here, you know, in fact, I'm going through this, like I have to cut them all off my CV, you know, and like all this stuff. And, you know, I get out here and like a lot of people, honestly, I think like some of my colleagues and people in town, like they think they th kind of thought like I was kind of jive, you know, actually. And their words, not mine. You know, like, who's this guy? Like, <sighs> jazz, like, what does he know? He's like 20 years old. And, you know, I never have told that story to anybody. Like nobody knows about Shell Lake and nobody, but when Sky was working on that article, I was like, well, I guess like, if you're gonna tell a story, like, I guess that's a story. It was the first time I ever had to stop and think about that. But, you know, Luke Gillespie taught a listening class and he just published this article like two years ago or three years ago about listening in Downbeat Magazine and I reread it and I'm like, this is a, an amazing article. And I remember all of this. Like I have a really good memory for certain kinds of like information. I was back just before the pandemic to oh, uh, receive that award right there on the wall. The President's Award, it's the highest mm -hmm. honor an alumni from the that, university yeah. can receive. It's for success in your chosen field. And that award and my next record came out and then and I was I had a tour. I was like gonna play like Catalina and like all these places and do this thing at Snuck Harbor and do this thing in Philadelphia at my record label and then like COVID came and it's like. <sighs> what did it mean to you to receive such a prestigious award, especially <laughs> in a community where you were familiar, you grew up, you know, your family's there. What did that mean to you? Oh, I, it means a great deal as you would imagine. I can die, I mean, I don't want to say I can die a happy man because it's like, this makes doing these CVs or whatever, like in typing out like what you do, like it makes me sick to my stomach really. Like, so I hate, like, it's not that, and I, you know, I don't want that to slow down my momentum or anything, but I'm very proud of that, and I mean, you know, it's, it's very touching to me, yeah. It's a very emotional thing, it's a special place. Was your, was your family there? Um... My wife was there, yeah, my, my daughter was there, yeah. Son, parents, Ron, Ron Kieser was there. I'm sorry, he passed away. And it's, you know, and, um, you know, Ron Kieser, you know, it's like a hero to me in that regard. And, you know, really inspires me. And I've met great people and musicians who don't need to vibe, you know, like for that, for those kind of reasons. And, um, you know, his loss was a big loss for, for the whole, that this whole musical community, all of these people. You he know, inspired we, so many people there. 
can you talk about how you know overcoming obstacles and challenges has you know not just made you a more sensitive person but made you into a stronger person yes i'd be happy to because i really want to start out with that i have a whole shit ton of white privilege that i'm riding on so you know there's a lot of other people who've overcome a lot more obstacles than me um but i do know about failure and uh you know so in, i have had my ex share of that which feels to me i think a little difficult different than you know necessarily like overcoming obstacles per se a fa but a failure failures are a challenge and i've had some big ones i believe that they move me closer to you know the true direction I should be going, you know. Um, in one particular rejection, I remember from many years ago, the rejection came also from a great artist that I respect so much. Still, uh, a symphonic percussionist that you know, all symphonic percussionists who play and have gigs would know his name. I don't want to say it because he rejected me, but um, you know, he also said, "Bloom where you're planted," you know. And I wanted to move to San Diego for the weather, but there are other aspects of this town, like I'm, you know, in terms of my family and things where, you know, I'm, I'm also kind of tied here a little bit. Um, at one point before I came here, I was in a position where, you know, kind of I would just be able to go where the job was. I think failure is a big one and how people respond to failure and rejection. Because in, in music, in music, oh, well, I, I'm so good at it now uh, because I've had so much of that. Yeah, you, I don't do it well. I never did. Who does, right? But I've, I've done it so much. I've had so much rejection and failure. As a musician, when you're young, you encounter that on the bandstand. No matter how great you are or who you are, at some point somewhere, you play and somebody rejects it at some point. You know, even Jeffrey Keezer was a great musician, and when he left high school, he had job offers from Miles Davis and Art Blakey. But somewhere along the way, he didn't do it right, you know? Something, somebody rejected it. Somebody, maybe it was his dad, Ron, or his mother, Mary, or something, and they said, no, that's not the way. But at some point, that happens. And, you know, I had a lot of that on the bandstand. I mean, I was never the most, I didn't feel like I was the most gifted. People would say things like that sometimes. But, you know, people praise people with phrases like that all the time. I certainly never felt gifted. And, you know, it was really hard. And so a lot of times I'd be playing and, you know, I'd be with a jazz musician and it'd be, they'd be like, you know, come on, you know. So I had a lot of that in my younger days, being that guy. I thought I was great at Eau Claire, and then I, I won my first audition, and it was like a cruise ship, and I was like the greenest guy in the world. And all of a sudden, I couldn't play everything perfectly, you know? And I knew like, wow, I am not the player I thought I was. You, I thought I was so much better when I was younger. And as I tell people nowadays, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna look back on today, this conversation right now, and I'm gonna be like, jeez, <laughs> you thought. You thought you knew it all, and like you were so stupid, you know. Overcoming rejection is it's so important as the musician, probably, but I think anything in life, you know. I people have I've been on the bandstand. I remember once I was on the bandstand with Laura Caviani, who is a great jazz pianist. And if you're a real jazz head, like you're gonna know her. Um, she's got some records out. Um, and uh, oh, her drummer is, uh, also plays with Karen Allison. Todd Strait, I mean, remember. she's Minneapolis. She did some stuff in Kansas City and has done some national tours. And she's very good, Laura Caviani. But we were on the, she was over here playing and I was over here on the other side of the stage. It was like nightclub. She was like a guest, you know, she didn't hire me, you know. So I would, but I, nonetheless, I was playing like a night with her, right? And I remember one tune, it's like, not that fast, you know, just like a medium swing. And she's playing great, these great phrases with great phrasing, you know, probably, I don't remember exactly, cause obviously, because I wasn't hearing it, but probably, you know, phrasing off the beat, you know, really well, and probably not doing anything that complicated other than just great phrasing. And I'm swinging along and it's, you know, she's looking over and it's, she's going. 
you know, and like, that's the worst thing. You know, she's mouthing, no, you know, no, wrong, you know, and she's being so nice about it. Like, that's the nice version of the many times those things have happened, especially when I was younger. Now, they don't, I don't, they're not allowed to happen anymore. Don't, I don't want to get the listening audience to get it wrong, per se. But then there's also those times where, you know, where those big things that you're doing, you know, you don't succeed at. And, you know, everybody has those. And they, and you might tell somebody about them and they might think that's not that big a deal, but we all go through them and they, they cut you down and they just demoralize you, right? And you drop and you fall. And in those moments, you know, I've taken solace in the idea that I'm going to be growing, you know, from those. Also, I have a huge reserve of love and support from my family, from my youth. And that's really helpful too, and a large network of friends that have supported me. But, you know, so I could see how those things could be, you know, more difficult to overcome for others than myself. So in some ways I've had less obstacles than some, I think. Yeah, absolutely. With a lot of love and support. You studied with some 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 real some real crazy cats through your through your days. I, I mean, did, I cause I you know, I have always been motivated by becoming the best musician that I could be and and my love for music and playing. And I've always had this vision that I've been alluding to, which you're seeing play out. You know, because of that, you know, I didn't just like go to the school and study with the guy. And I, and I didn't just get the doctorate because I had my master's and my job already and I wanted to get tenure, you know. I got my degrees and I practiced and I sought out great teachers because I just wanted to be the artist that I envisioned. Like when I practiced and I saw myself in the mirror, I knew like, I'm good. You know, so first of all, you got to see yourself. Like that's a big lesson. I know I mentioned I have imposter syndrome, but you do have to have confidence and you have to have a vision for yourself. So, you know, I had that and I always wanted to, I felt like I, I had an obligation. It's not from a selfish standpoint, but like my parents always, it was always this Protestant value of like, contribute to your community. And I always felt, you know, com compelled, like deeply compelled, you know, and and had a lot of faith that this was the way that I was supposed to contribute to my community. So, you know, that's, that's what I did. And I sought out the greatest teachers I could because I wanted to become the voracious learner that I envisioned for myself. And so, yeah, I don't even remember. It's actually, it's on, I can, it's great that we're here and I'm bogged down with this horrible like thing right now. Cause I can list like Corey Andrey, I studied timpani with him. He's Minnesota opera. Harold Bosarge, he played with Freddie Hubbard, drum set. Rainer, Car Rainer Carroll, principal timpanist, L.A. Phil. Arup Chattopadhyay is like a A-rated, grade A All India radio tabla artist. It means that he's really good if you know tabla. Um, Jeff Kroll and Kirk Gartner and John Wooten were who I studied with at university. But then, and Ron Kieser as well. Then David King, like weekly for a long time. Eugene Kolbeck, who was had studied djembe with a master and drummer, uh, went to Africa to learn. Joe Morello, I, I won an undergraduate research grant to be awarded the monetary you know, resources to get myself out to, I got a fixed amount of money and I spread it out. I found a way where I could go like every two or three weeks throughout the year to go take lessons with Joe Morello. Um, Jazz vibraphone I studied with Larry Pinella, the jazz teacher at uh, SDSU, and um, and that's it. And my first drum teacher, you know, Tim Tim Stanton, who was like my, I played in a band with my dad. Yeah, so, but I mean, that's quite a few, I think, right? So, you know, and it's not enough. You know, there are, I'm, but I don't have time anymore. But a lot of times I'm working on stuff like, man, I really want to take a lesson with so-and-so. So throughout my educational experience, 
it was, I was always being driven by this like vision and this learning, you know, and not, it's not just like getting a degree or, you know, some other kind of a thing. And, you know, I really have found myself like somewhat in somewhat bohemian territory for that. Surprisingly, I never realized that I would be, you know, but, and honestly, I feel like sometimes more so on the West Coast, it's really strange. Um, but, you know, I think artistry, seeking artistry drove me to seek out great teachers or people that I, you know, thought were great teachers. You know, I, all those people, if you're in my field, you'll recognize those names for being people who are known for being great teachers because those were the people that I sought out. It's a wide variety, a wide variety of different players there too. And there, there's a list of probably 10 to 20 people I've taken one or two lessons with that aren't here. Steve Houghton, various, Carl Allen, you know, Lewis Nash, I mean like all kinds of other people I've taken one lesson with, but I don't list them, you know, I don't consider them and I've forgotten half of their names, I'm sure. You know, but I think definitely seeking more opinions was something that I learned was valuable at Eau Claire and from my experience as a chalet. I learned the importance of, you know, humbling your perspective to take in the perspectives of others, you know, and learn from other people. Can you talk about that a little bit, just like your passion for learning? Well, it's, I think it, for me, it really stems from, I feel a sense of urgency every day to move towards this vision and to produce something for my community that will be worthwhile and fulfill this calling to the point where it can be challenging to those who love me because they see me sometimes wake up with this sense of urgency and like this sense of like uh, struggle struggling against what a normal person would want to do in a day and what I feel deeply compelled to to do to stay the course. I mean, and there are so many factors. It's not just some kind of like, I'm compelled to do this. There's logistical factors that contribute to that as well. Like if you, it's like that whole, like, you know, it's like a Wesley Snipes movie, like you're a one million dollar asset to the government. Yeah, it's like if you spend every, every like every, more or less, you know, more or less every day for 20 years, working all day really hard to do something really well, wouldn't you be a little motivated to continue to utilize and develop those resources, right? Like, so, but I recognize that to do so, I'm needing to learn new things. So I was telling Justin, like when you guys were setting up, like in the, in the last, uh, in the last uh, three weeks or so, I've listened to uh, 2,818 songs, new songs, like distributed releases across all genres, you know, to firmly root myself in today's genres, today's musical climate, to the listening habits of young people and old people today and you know to help me find my own self within the, the midst of all of that and i was telling justin you know there were there were some negative takeaways from that broadly but also one big positive takeaway was that my music is great music and that conviction for 20 or however 25 years or no whatever it's 20 years it's been has been fruitful and it's really important to remember that.
that, that, that you acquired in, in really honing your craft in music has, ha, has like, transferred to, to other things, like, like in the real oh. world? Oh, wow. It's like, a lot of that's probably, I don't know if it's good. My wife would probably like, <laughs> geez, well, I'm absent-minded. I, you know, I can only, I feel like I can only cram so much in my head, you know. I have, like, how many concertos and, like, solo pieces and, like, things I'm working on up here. And there's, like, only so much sometimes. Like, that's one way that it's affected me, and that's not a positive thing, I know. Maybe not what you were looking for. I did a cognitive battery test once, and my, you know, for my wife is a research, psycho psychological researcher, and, like, one of her colleagues or something did this thing, and they, um... I didn't do, when I was younger, I took like IQ tests and stuff and I thought I did good on like the words and things. And I, but I have always been a slow reader. And I didn't do like, I did like, you know, above average or whatever on this, like good on this like language part, but the part with the numbers, like I got all the way to the end of the numbers that they have. And she was like, I don't have any more numbers and nobody ever gets to the end of the numbers. It was like the recalling, recalling numbers and short term memory. She was like listing off like bazillions of numbers and be like one, two, seven, five, blah, 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 back. Not that it was easy. Don't get me wrong. I'm like, I am not a genius or anything. It was kind of like hard. It was like what I do when I play music, what it feels like sometimes when I'm playing, you know, some Bach, like I could walk over there and I could play like Bach for seven minutes and I'd be going through all kinds of notes and it would, I'd be using a certain kind of memory that, you know, has I think been improved through through my study of musicianship but there are you know there are I'm sure there are other things I don't use as much um, and you know I think my family might help develop those muscles a little bit more too so that's going back to the question about how family has impacted this that would be one positive thing is you know it's humbling you know it requires you to you know, teamwork and communication you know, and, and like all of that stuff. So I, you know, I think that just touched on a little bit. Like one other thing I would could say, it's like, I, I don't know if I'm getting right at your question the way you'd like me to, but you know, when my in my first lesson with Joe Morello, he said, you know, there's actually a conversation first about respect for the art and being a student of his, you know, and what was expected sort of in that, in that kind of a way. But then there was also, discussion of like your physical health and your body because and i think that might be one of the one of the most impactful things i took from him even though it was not musical directly but drumming requires your body to be in shape like an athlete and you have to keep your body healthy if you want to be a drummer and Another thing I firmly believe is that, you know, no musician who, who hung it up or quit ever became a great musician. You know, no, no musician who, who hung it up ever won the audition. So, you know, those two ideas, staying physically healthy and, uh, per, you know, I guess per, the idea of perseverance, but specifically in regard to being a musician, you know, they're like, they're kind of related, you know, and, um, so when I heard that, that was also like a year after David King encouraged me about practice and hard work and he let and he let me the thing that was encouraging to me was that he one lesson I remember David talking to me about some of the great drummers who exploded in their 30s. Cuz David King did the same thing. You know, he was so great, always so great, but before the bad plus Y'all didn't know, you know. And he even lived out here in LA. And he was a, you know, so he, he has a vision too. So he was inspirational to me and remains inspirational to me in that way. But I remember him talking about, oh, Elvin Jones this and when he was in his thirties. And it's like, it doesn't, it, you don't, if, you know, when you put all three of those things together, I think it helps give you tools to run a long race, you know, and it, and it also kind of gets at what you were asking about, about how music's has spilled out into other areas. There are qualities of musicianship that, you know, influence leadership and, you know, how you interact with others and, um, you know, um, empathy. Um, you know, work, you know. Uh, I th there's yeah, there are many other ways that it's that it spills over as well.
Can you see completely unrelated to music? <laughs> I, I, no, <laughs> actually, I can't. I mean, I love chess, but I haven't played in like 15 years because I do music. I work really hard on my music. Come to chess night tonight. I have chess night every Monday night. <laughs> I, I'm so. I, I might like to come sometime. Thanks for yeah. the invite, but I couldn't come today. I'm like so. No, you're bad. Dude, one, one night for sure. I, I, I'm, I'm a huge. I'm a chestnut. You should I'm, I'm have like a dude. list of things oh. that are that I like. Things that I could like dive into with a you know voraciously to get done, but that's one chess. I've I'm a long distance runner, avid, but I'm an avid long distance runner who has not been able to run long distance for a few years for. Some of these reasons we've talked about. I've run a couple marathon, full marathons, and uh, um, that's important to me. Um, and then also, I love baseball and the Packers, but I haven't paid attention to either of them in like 20, 15, or 20 years. I played baseball in high school and I batted a thousand because I got one hit and I walked. And then I quit to play drum set and Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I am, you know, really multidimensional, but in all areas, you know, I have, you know, music has usurped. Uh, middle school and high school, I did, prof I did like the, I don't know, it's, not it's professional if you're winning, but I did the NCSA chess tournaments with my good friend Craig Spencer, who worked for the NSA. Now he's a full tenured math professor at Kansas State University, where I got my master's degree. Um, and then and Craig and Justin, who is a senior database programmer or something for Microsoft, he and uh, those two and I were like, we were like, they were my best buds for a while. And so like computers and chess and baseball and the Packers and, you know, that's pretty much it. You know, that's like me and going for a run. I'm half Japanese. Lauren is full Japanese. Um, oh. Your wife. Nihongo <laughs> hanshimasu ka? Hanasere. Ah, so so so. <laughs> um, did you, you know, I noticed in your biography that um, you've been internationally toured for sure. Uh, yeah. But particularly, is there something because we. I love what? Japan. I studied Japanese in high school. The, my Japanese teacher in high school um, won, uh, you know, a few. After I, I, he had a successful teaching career, he was a beloved Japanese teacher, um, I think a skillful teacher, and I took it as my elective for like three years instead of Spanish or German, which most other people did. I took it because I have always had the, I don't know, I walked my own path and I knew like this would be cool. I could do things in Asia with this, right? How cool is that? I'm a musician. By the time I was in a sophomore in high school taking Japanese, I'd already been playing gigs for a long time. I started playing drum set. I was the one, if you played, you know, it's like 1996, five, 94, 93. So if you're in 1993, if you're in that area in Wisconsin, if you play guitar, you're probably playing like alternative rock and like, you know, stuff like that. And you probably wanted me to play drums with you. And if you were playing at a bar, you probably wanted me to do that with you. And you know, like when I was 13, like Craig Barr called the house and my, he was like, I remember the conversation and my dad's talking and he's like, well, I would have to come and play guitar too. <laughs> like you got a gig. Okay, so by sophomore in high school, I already had a gig. And so I'm thinking like Japanese, yeah, I can do cool things. Europe understands English more, I think. I'm gonna learn this Asian language. So I did that, and then in college, I um, there was like a pretty Japanese girl, and she was a tutor for the Japanese class. And I was like, hey, I need some tutoring too, but I wasn't in the Japanese class, isn't that kind of cool? <laughs> so anyway, that's what I did, and I tutored, tutored with her, even though I wasn't in Japanese class. But then, like two years later, I, added a global studies minor and I needed Japanese. So I took, I actually took that Japanese class. So by the time I graduated with my undergrad, I had this like kind of like, you know, more intensive battery of Japanese education than your typical student. And, and it's just conversational. You know, I'm not really, really my daughter is great. So, but 
the the residency and the Japanese, the trip and playing in Japan really came from a colleague over there who teaches at uh, Kyushu Lutheran University. I remember because I'm going through all this junk right now. And um, she had an artist series and the year before she had like Gustavus wind ensemble out. And like we were, had been talking on Facebook or something. She's like, hey, next year I have you out. Great. And then, and also happened to meet Nobuko or me, it might have come about like because I met Nobuko. I like I was thinking, oh, I have I'll have a guy. I could have a guy too, and this opportunity is available to me. So now might be a good time. So for whatever reason, I don't remember which came first, but you know Nobuko came along as my guide, and then I went. Um, I did a residency at that university, and then also Yamaha. I was the drumline instructor at San Diego State University and we ordered snare drums from Yamaha and they sent us the drums that don't have steel reinforced hoops and I have a lot of marching experience but I didn't know they were supposed to have that. They're supposed to know. So the kids reefed the bottom of the drums like I asked them to, like I always would and the, like, the drums collapsed. Yamaha had to send a whole new thing of drums. And you know it was really unfortunate, but like they kind of felt bad. And their the drum the factory they make the drums at was in Osaka, and so then I also went there and uh, walked that drum through the through the factory and uh, met the Nakata family, who's the family that really made the Yamaha drums. And now they make Sakai drums because that was also the time that the Yamaha Corporation built a factory in China and like basically severed, you know their business relationship with that family that had been making the drums for so long, it was kind of actually kind of a sad thing for them. So, but I did that residency there and then did the, went to Osaka and did the Sakai thing and then played at some, used my, you know, my wife's help to, you know, set up some other playing opportunities between the residency and like her, you know, where her family lived and stuff and we traveled and things some point would you I, mind if we literally just followed you around in Japan I would love to in fact um, the trumpet player that I recently used here right before the pandemic and I was about to use a lot more um, his name's Kazunori get this like you know when I said it was like stochastic it really like there's so much serendipitous magic in my life because his name is Kazunori Tanaka and he's like cousins with my wife's family and he's like he he was like you know one o'clock's like awesome solo trumpet player and like the guy that I wanted for this thing anyway so then I call him you know to see if he would like you know be a guy that would play in my bands on tour and then like come out for this thing that we did at Dizzy's last fall and I think, or I don't know if I knew first or which one came first actually, but either way, it's like, wow, how cool is that? And we were talking about, um, I was talking to him about doing logistics better and doing a better Japanese tour. Of course, COVID kind of messed that up, but I would love to go back and do a Japanese tour and have you guys freaking come along. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Because that would be badass. That would be super awesome. That would be, yeah. that would be super badass. Yep. And have that recorded? I would freaking die. <laughs>